The vast universe holds many secrets, and the James Webb Space Telescope, JWST, is on track to uncover some of them. Described as a time machine, the Webb Telescope itself doesn't travel through time directly. However, what it does is much more profound than just giving us clues about the past. The Supreme Observatory can voyage back to the edge of time, not by actually going anywhere, but by sending us direct images of some of the earliest moments of the universe. These images show us what it would have looked like more than 13 billion years ago, watching the first galaxies form. Besides the breathtaking images revealing some of the first chapters of the universe, James Webb also shocked the world by detecting galaxies shown in our cosmic history much sooner than scientists ever expected. Some of these galaxies are even so old and extreme that they resemble fossils from the early universe. This finding caused a galactic controversy that has astronomers around the world excited and puzzled. The James Webb Space Telescope has recently provided humanity with awe-inspiring photographs of distant celestial bodies, heralding a new era in astronomy. These stunning images captured by the JWST, such as the Carina Nebula and Stefan's Quintet, offer a glimpse into the mysteries of the universe and ignite our sense of wonder. However, the impact of the JWST extends beyond mere visual marvels. The technology used in this space telescope traces its origin back to more than 50 years ago when Well Gore and Associates, a startup company, developed insulated cables for Apollo 11's lunar lander. These cables, which displayed exceptional resilience in the harsh conditions of space, have evolved to become the foundation for high speed computer data transmission and undersea communication cables today. They serve as crucial components in the space wire assemblies of the Webb telescope enabling the transmission of breathtaking infrared photographs from the far reaches of the universe. As a result, the James Webb Space Telescope is changing astronomy in many ways, from peering into the atmosphere of exoplanets to capturing stunning images of distant cosmic phenomena. But perhaps its greatest scientific contribution is its ability to observe galaxies that are so distant that looking at them is like looking back in time. Projects like WebSeer's Cosmic Evolution Early Release Science Survey are scanning the sky to pick out some of the oldest galaxies we've ever seen. When scientists first turned Webb toward apparently empty patches of sky to look for these distant galaxies, they found something very strange. They didn't just find a few old galaxies dating back a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, they found far more of these galaxies than anyone had predicted. According to one of the leading Sears researchers, Michaela Bagley of the University of Texas, the theoretical models didn't predict that these galaxies should be there. We still don't yet know how you can see a galaxy that bright that early, she said. One particular galaxy jumped out of the Sears data straight away, Maisie's galaxy, named after the daughter of one of the researchers, which is 13 billion years old, making it one of the oldest galaxies ever observed and it's much brighter and much bluer than anyone predicted. When discussing these galaxies, scientists typically talk about them in terms of their age rather than their distance. You'll see researchers describe a galaxy as being from the first few hundred million years after the Big Bang rather than located billions of miles from Earth. That's also because of the expansion of the universe, which creates a moving frame of reference that makes it hard to describe distance meaningfully. Examples include galaxies like Maisie's Galaxy, which is described as being 13 billion years old. The light has traveled 13 billion years to reach us, but if we could see Maisie's Galaxy today, it is much further away because in that time, the universe has kept expanding and accelerating its expansion. The time the light has spent traveling to us gives us more concrete information about when in the universe we're observing these galaxies, Bagley explained. Scientists had already produced models of what early galaxies would be, but Webb contradicted them almost immediately. As soon as scientists began looking for early galaxies, they found far more of them than they had predicted and found that they were much brighter too. At first, it seemed like the issue could be due to the calibration of Webb's instruments, an ongoing process that took some time even when the telescope began its operations but subsequent observations have backed up this early and puzzling finding. What we see with Webb doesn't make sense with the models of the universe we have. The high number of early galaxies detected suggests that there's something we don't yet understand about galaxy formation and how that process has changed between billions of years ago and now, 
Bagley said. The fact that the galaxies are brighter than expected is intriguing too and could have several explanations. These galaxies could actually be giving off more light, or they could be more massive, or it could be a combination, as the two factors are related. So, if you have small galaxies with a ton of stars, is that what's going on, or do you have big galaxies with a normal amount of stars? Bagley summed up the big question, it could be both or either. The early universe had galaxies with potentially as many stars as the Milky Way, and we don't have an explanation for how these stars could have formed so early or in such great numbers. There's currently no consensus on what is the root of the discrepancy between the models we have and the data we observe with Webb. The answer could be related to dark matter and its role in the early universe, or it could be that the way early galaxies were formed was spurred on by forces that haven't been considered yet. But noting that even before the James Webb Space Telescope, scientists knew that the early universe was a very different place from the universe today. Its galaxies were made almost entirely of hydrogen and helium, were shaped by tendrils of dark matter, and hosted enormous bright stars that lived fast and died young. While the laws of physics haven't changed over the past billions of years, the scale of the universe has, and that affects how those physical laws apply to galaxies. When the universe was smaller and denser, that affected the ways in which stars form in complex ways. If the universe is smaller, the density inside galaxies and outside galaxies is probably higher, Bagley explained. If it's dense and hot, the gas will collapse to form stars. If it's dense and cold, then you could get a ton more stars. Another way in which the early universe was fundamentally different is in its overall chemical composition. Heavy elements like metals were almost entirely absent in the early universe because these elements were primarily formed within stars and spread by their explosive deaths called supernova. It took several generations of stars to spread these heavier elements through the universe and to be absorbed into stars similar to those we see today. The hypothetical earliest stars in existence are referred to as population 3 stars. Today's young stars are population 1 stars, and the numbering counts backwards in age. They were much bigger, heavier, and bluer than stars today, and they gave off more ionizing radiation. Those differences are because of the way stars generate heat and light in a process called fusion. If a star is made only of hydrogen and helium, to do fusion, the star has to be hotter and denser than a star that has carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, Bagley explained. There's a different chemical pathway to create fusion, and that requires a larger size and more mass to support it. No one has ever observed a population 3 star before, and finding one is one of the holy grails of modern astronomy, Bagley believes. It could be possible to find one using the James Webb Space Telescope. It's hopeful and it's optimistic, but I do think it's realistic, she said. All of this discussion of billion-year-old history might seem rather abstract, but in fact, it's directly relevant to understanding the universe as we see it today. And as the James Webb Space Telescope is revealing in greater detail than ever before, that's because astronomy operates on such long-term scales that we can't watch objects like galaxies across their lifespans. Most galaxies we see around us today look like the Milky Way, but we can't see them develop over time. To study that development, we need to look for distant and ancient galaxies, which Bagley refers to as baby pictures of the Milky Way. This is all about understanding how our Milky Way formed. It sounds cliche, but before we can understand where we are and where we're going, we need to understand where we came from. Put the early galaxies aside, the James Webb Space Telescope has just detected the earliest and most direct signature for carbon-rich dust grains from the early universe. Experts had previously thought that elements heavier than hydrogen and helium were signatures of older galaxies, but the presence of carbon in young galaxies suggests otherwise and challenges current theories about dust formation. A study published in Nature offers vital clues about cosmic dust and its role in galaxy evolution in the first billion years of cosmic time. Cosmic dust grains can range in size from just a few molecules to 0.004 in or 0.1 mm and can vary greatly in composition. After mostly forming in stars, dust is thrown into space by various elements like winds or supernova. Dust-filled areas can make observing a challenge because it absorbs light. 
Fortunately, depending on the chemical composition of the dust molecules, different elements absorb light at different specific wavelengths. By noting the wavelengths of light that are blocked, astronomers can essentially reveal what the dust is made of. Using this technique and data from the JWST, researchers at the University of Cambridge were able to detect carbon-rich dust grains one billion years after the universe came into existence. Observations of the local modern-day universe often find these same carbon-based molecules, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, and microscopic graphites. However, astronomers have long thought that these molecules should not exist in the distant early universe because they wouldn't have had time to form. Models have suggested it would take hundreds of millions of years to form PAHs. Detecting this carbon-rich dust in the early universe is changing how experts understand the cosmos. Researchers are now hypothesizing about what could have created it so soon after the Big Bang. Alternatively, perhaps the dust astronomers are seeing isn't carbon-rich PAHs and graphites. Based on exactly which wavelengths the observed dust is absorbing, lead author Eurus Witz of Sydney Sussex College in Cambridge, England, suspects the dust might instead be a mix of diamond-like or graphite-like grains. These types of grains can be formed in short time frames by material ejected from supernovae, including those of very massive and short-lived stars. If true, the discovery would fit much more neatly into our current picture of star and dust formation. Before the James Webb Space Telescope, multiple observations of galaxies had to be combined to observe how their light was affected by dust absorption. Experts were forced to study older galaxies that had enough time to gather dust and form stars, limiting their ability to pinpoint the sources of cosmic dust. With JWST's powerful capabilities, scientists can now see light from dwarf galaxies that have existed since the first billion years of cosmic time and observe the origin of their dust in detail. According to study co-author Irene Chave of the University of Arizona's Centro de Astrobiology, CAB, we are planning to work further with theorists who model dust production and growth in galaxies. This will shed light on the origin of dust and heavy elements in the early universe. Despite the James Webb Space Telescope's groundbreaking discoveries, astronomers are already busy thinking about what will come after Webb, and they've got grand, ambitious plans. The big plan for the next decades of astronomy research is to find habitable planets and maybe even to search for signs of life beyond Earth. That's the goal of the Habitable Worlds Observatory, a space telescope currently in the planning phase that is aimed at discovering 25 Earth-like planets around Sun-like stars. One of the big challenges in finding habitable planets beyond our solar system is that we can rarely see these far-off planets directly because planets are so small and dim compared to stars. So, to identify an exoplanet, astronomers generally infer its existence due to its effects on its host star. Currently, tools like the Hubble or James Webb Space Telescope most often look for dips in a star's brightness when a planet passes in front of it, called a transit or they look for a wobble of the star caused by the gravity of the planet, called the radial velocity method. These methods give us clues, but to really understand exoplanets in depth, we need to be able to image them directly. Current telescopes are rarely able to do this, because it requires such a high level of precision. But scientists are already planning out a next generation of space telescopes that will be able to take images of exoplanets. The next big space telescope to be launched is the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. Scheduled to launch in 2027. It will perform a survey of the sky to estimate how many habitable exoplanets are out there. After that comes the Habitable Worlds Observatory, a planned space telescope that will directly image Earth-like exoplanets around Sun-like stars and is scheduled to launch around 2040. This will be the best chance we'll have to date of discovering habitable Earth-like worlds where we could search for evidence of life beyond Earth. However, unlike Webb's infrared eyes, the plan for the Habitable Worlds Observatory is to look in the optical and ultraviolet wavelengths. These wavelengths are useful for identifying the signatures of specific atoms, such as hydrogen or oxygen. So, we can point our instruments toward a planet and learn what its atmosphere is composed of. There are all sorts of options for what particular atoms or compounds we could look for, but oxygen is the leading choice right now for what is called a biomarker or a clue that indicates the potential presence of life. 
Spotting oxygen on a distant planet may be a sign that it warrants further inspection. Oxygen gives off a very strong signal, which makes it relatively easier to detect. In particular, ozone, which is a variation of oxygen with three atoms bound together, has a very strong signature in the ultraviolet wavelength. With its focus on optical and ultraviolet wavelengths, the Habitable Worlds Observatory will be more similar to the Hubble Space Telescope than the James Webb Space Telescope, and that brings some advantages. Infrared telescopes like Webb are very sensitive to temperature because when things get hot, they give off infrared radiation. So, to work accurately, Webb needs to be cooled to extremely low operating temperatures of just a few Kelvin. For some instruments, that makes the telescope more complex and expensive to build, as it requires a cryogenic cooling system. Another key difference between infrared telescopes like Webb and optical-slash-ultraviolet telescopes like the Habitable Worlds Observatory is the mirror. Webb's primary mirror is coated with gold, which reflects infrared light very well. But an optical-slash-ultraviolet telescope has a mirror coated with silver, which is more efficient at reflecting those wavelengths. In some ways, we already know exactly what sorts of instruments will be required to look for habitable worlds, as these are updates to existing instruments rather than entirely new concepts. But refining these instruments and making them more accurate is not a trivial endeavor. Thus, more theoretical advances are required as well. Even with a brand new telescope equipped with brand new technology, however, it won't be a simple matter to find life beyond our solar system. That's because habitability is a complex concept that requires more than just identifying an Earth-like planet orbiting a sun-like star. A planet that looks like it's about the right brightness to be an Earth-sized planet, that has a roughly circular orbit in what we would call the habitable zone, shows some evidence for water vapor, maybe some oxygen, there's no inner giant planet that has stirred things up, the star isn't too active, that's kind of the system we're hoping to find as a candidate for a potentially habitable planet said Scott Gotti of The Ohio State University. But as tempting as it is to imagine a scenario where we build this telescope, find a habitable planet, then immediately detect life, that's not how this will work. To properly search for habitable exoplanets, we really have to get the whole context, which means studying the other planets in the system, the debris disks, studying the stars, and so on, Gotti said. That's what's really going to help us understand whether or not these planets are truly habitable. When there's a temptation to imagine that we're going to build the Habitable Worlds Observatory and we're going to find life and we're done, Gotti said, but it's not going to work that way. If we're lucky, we're going to find one or two, maybe three systems that look pretty promising, and then we're going to have to build something even bigger and better. Even if we're able to find the ideal-looking system with a potentially habitable Earth-like world, then the next step would be to look at even more advanced factors, such as how much of the planet is covered by oceans and how much is landmass. Searching for life isn't something that is going to be solved anytime soon, but scientists are now laying the groundwork for the Habitable Worlds Observatory to take on the next part of the job in 20 years' time or so. And that's similar to the way that planning for the James Webb Space Telescope began around the year 2000 and scientists today are just starting to be able to use this tool for discovery. And because wondering whether life could exist beyond Earth is one of the most profound questions facing science today, and it won't be solved quickly, the Habitable Worlds Observatory is the next step on that journey. But it won't be the end point, for sure, as Gotti said, this is a multi-generational, probably multi-century endeavor that we're on, and I think that we should be optimistic about that process, but we should also be humble. Well, that's all the information that we have for you today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit that bell so you never miss out on future episodes. And be sure to tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content like this and to always improve. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.